So let's turn in your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Ruth chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. We're going to look through 1 through 9, actually. Ruth chapter 3. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment. I've never done this before in this congregation. just love to learn a little bit as a pastor. If you've been married uh, 40 years or more, would you stand and just remain standing? 40 years? Look at that. My gosh, it is possible, yes. 40 years, beautiful. Okay, anybody above 40? Raise your hand if you can. Okay, look at this. Oh my goodness. Okay, very good. Praise the Lord. Love to hear that. Good, that's a beautiful sight. Uh, does it have to be the same person? It's always one in the crowd. It's, uh, I, it can never be simple. You have to complicate it. Yeah, whatever. Okay, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, some of you had needed a calculator to add it all up, and I think you can. some of you came to 40. All right, that's great. Okay, well, last week we started a series on uh, intimacy, and we, we focused on intimacy. Last week we focused on intimacy with God. Okay, this week we're going we're gonna to focus on intimacy with uh, with a spouse, and we're going to speak especially to singles in a moment as well. And next week, we talk about intimate relationships with people that are disciplers, mentors, people who pour into our life. What do I mean by intimacy? Intimacy, I define as to, as best you can now, fully know somebody and to be fully known. To be in a relationship with someone, be a God or, or a spouse, to fully know somebody and to fully be known. Okay, so many of you have been married over 30 or 40, 50 years. I would, I would hope at this point in time that your relationships have a level of intimacy that is, has been seasoned over time. There are some things that you know about your spouse that no one else knows, I would hope. Intimate details about their life. See, relationships can start out on a very basic level. I guess they would be called acquaintances, and that's just the exchange of facts you know, weather and sports conversation, business conversation, very superficial. They have a purpose. Then maybe one step below facts, as we talked about last week, would be opinions. Okay, maybe you're going to share your opinion with somebody. What, what is your particular opinion on politics or business or whatever? And then perhaps below that, we're starting to get into relationships where we share um, our passions, our dreams, our frustrations, our challenges our vulnerability, our sin. Now we're getting into an area of transparency. We're getting into an area of connectedness. We're getting into intimacy. Into me, he sees. And then a very intimate relationship, just beyond physical, is a prayer relationship, or an earnest prayer relationship between two people. It can be quite intimate. Now, as I said last week, why did I begin a series on this? Because I need help in this area. And the best way to do that is to go into the Word to find help. Okay, another thing we did last week is I pulled this out, very unusual, don't do this very often. This is called a talit, for those who were not here. Tal in Hebrew meaning uh, tent, eat meaning little, little tent. This little tent, this prayer shawl has significance, how many threads and colors and such as that. But basically, this is a covering. And this covering comes over us and God has given us a visual using the Jewish customs of what an intimate relationship with the Father looks like. Does it mean you have to wear one of these? No, it doesn't. But this is a visual for those of us who enjoy visuals. In here, with God, I'm focused on my relationship with him, not you. I'm focused on the pressure treated two by 10 in my own eyeball, not the speck of sawdust in yours. I'm focused on the life that he gave me, the challenges he places before me, the words he speaks to me, my love for him and his love for me. In here, I grow and I display that growth out there. In here, it's just me and him, you and him. This, what happens in here is what I bring to my marriage. What happens in here is what I bring to you. What happens in here sometimes never leaves here but changes what's inside. This is a relationship with God that is not religious, robotic, it's relational, it's real, it's effective. It's 
personal. That's intimacy. So God gives us this visual for that. I encourage you to, you know, this is the prayer closet, you see. This is, uh, this is where no one sees what you're doing to think better of you for doing it. This is anonymity. This is character building. This is sitting at the feet of a king right here. This must be in all of our lives for our lives to be balanced outside this covering. This is where decisions are made about sacrifice and love and prayer over my family. This is what this is. Must have this, must have it. Okay, let's go to Ruth chapter three. I'm gonna read something to you first. Familiarity, now let's, let's, let's contrast intimacy. Familiarity and intimacy are not the same. They're not. Some of you have been married many decades, you could be very, very familiar with one another, but that's not intimacy. Each one has value in life, certainly in married life, but no one is, no one thing like intimacy or familiarity is a replacement for the other. If one is confused for the other, we'll have the basis for major human and marital unrest. In marriage, familiarity is inescapable. We have to be familiar with one another. We're in the same proximity. So on that level, it's inescapable. It happens almost imperceptibly. Intimacy is usually hard to come by. Just because you've been married all those years doesn't mean you have an intimacy in your relationship. It must be deliberately sought and opened up and responded to. Familiarity brings a degree of ease and comfort into a relationship, but intimacy anxiously searches for deep understanding and personal appreciation. Teenagers, you can't have this level of intimacy at a very early age in a relationship with another person. Not meant to be. It's something we deliberately grow into. Okay, now let's talk about singles before they feel left out. How many of you are single here? Raise your hand. Okay, excellent. Got some good looking singles in this church. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right, I'm gonna read something to you. This, this is uh, very important, because in our culture, single people, it's not fair, there's a stigma about it. And I don't like it, it's not right, it's not biblical. That somehow or another, if you're single, you're less than. Now, who came up with that? That's not right. Here's what the Bible has to say. Let's go with what the Bible has to say. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35. Paul's writing to single people. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. That's interesting. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married, uh, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. Oh, for sure I get an amen on that. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way an undivided devotion to the Lord. Single people, you are maybe perhaps called to be single. And in that calling to be single, which is a very noble one, your aim there is an undivided, devoted heart to the Lord. Undivided, undistracted call to devotion to the Lord. Look at your non-married status as an advantage, Paul is saying. Here's a mistake I see single make, people make in life. I saw this one college students many years ago. Everyone was praying for a spouse. God, show me who I'm gonna marry, right? Maybe your grandchildren do this. Show me who I'm gonna marry, send me a spouse. I'm looking for a husband, I'm looking for a wife. Long ago, before women, when they weren't treated the way they should have been treated, they were said they went to, to school and college for an M, from MRS degree. You ever heard that before? Like women went to college to get married. Okay, well, come on. Now, we're not really supposed to 
worry about who we're gonna marry, what we're supposed to do is prepare ourselves to be the person, to be the wife or the husband we're going to be. And this is what he's talking about. An aim to devote themselves to the affairs of the Lord. What a noble calling. To concern yourself with the Lord's affairs. The aim, the aim of singleness is a devotedness to Christ, an un, undivided heart. Now he says later, he says, now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. He says it in a, in a very positive way. You single people, and some of you get this, I watch you. Very carefully, I watch you. You devote yourselves to the church, to the ministry, to the Lord. I've seen people in this room, in their single state, before they got married, really, really grow as people. Really grow as people, as, as believers. And real preparation for whatever the Lord had, had for them. And in so doing, they really prepared themselves. If you're not married though you wanna be, don't go looking for the spouse, go looking for the Lord and prepare yourself to have that marriage that is off the charts for failure to do so in preparation. I often pray for my daughter's husband, who I have no idea who that would be. And I can't believe she was pregnant this morning. That's another thing. <laughs> Let me clarify for those who watch three months from now on the tape, we had a skit and she played a pregnant woman, thank you. All right, so singles, you have a specific aim and goal. It's a beautiful thing. All right, now, let's look at Ruth. We're gonna read this. Ruth chapter three, verse one through nine. Beautiful story. Beautiful story. One day, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whom servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. Well, I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. We need to know the importance of covering. Covering is huge in the Bible. Adam and Eve had to cover themselves, their shame, after the fall. Uh, the high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and cover or atone for the sins of the people. We like to cover our mistakes. Psychologists call them ego defense mechanisms. We like to rationalize what we do to make it look no worse than it actually is. Covering is very important. Now, here's what would happen. A threshing floor is a place where you take the grain and you throw it up, and once it's cracked, and the wind will blow the, uh, the wheat and separate it from the chaff or the barley, whatever. Well, a servant in that, cust in that, in that time would lay perpendicular to the feet of a person, their master, and the master, it was, it was accepted then that whatever covering the master had over him, the servant could borrow a corner of it and get under it. It's the way it was. There was no impropriety, it was just the custom. So usually at the foot of a bed in a tent in the desert, or whatever it was, a servant would lay perpendicular and maybe cover up just a bit with the excess covering of the master. Well, this is a proposal here now, what Ruth is doing in this beautiful romantic scene. What she's doing is she's gently uncovering his feet. He wakes up and she, she asks just to be covered. This is, where, this is where a marriage proposal comes in. How many of you had a really cool romantic proposal when you married, when you married, before you married your wife? Men on one knee, serenading, anybody? No serenading, okay. Well, in this, in this culture, this is a deeply special moment for he has a duty to fulfill as a kinsman. We'll talk about that in a moment. All right, let's talk about covering and we'll talk about marriages. 
a priest was not allowed to rip his garments. It says throughout the Old Testament. You know, these Jewish people are very demonstrative and emotional. I say that with the utmost respect. But if you got somebody really hacked off, they're going to rip their clothes. It's a sign of grief and distress and despair. The only person that was not allowed to tear their garment was a priest. I'll tell you why. Because it meant despair and grief, and, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation. In fact, they were even double-sewed so that you couldn't rip them. But on the night that Christ was, was uh, arrested, he met with a guy named Caiaphas. You read about this in John chapter 8. And he went to him, and Caiaphas basically made him tell him that he was the Christ. He says, before Abraham was, I am. I am the Christ, he says. And then the high priest rips his garment. He wasn't supposed to do that. Because the high priest is the one that would go into the presence of God in the tabernacle or the temple. And no one was ever to go in the presence of God having said by ripping their ephod or their garment that something is impossible, it's grief, it's despair, it's over. You were never supposed to do that. In fact, if you go back, when Caiaphas ripped his garment, the priesthood was over from that day forward. There's no priesthood today because he ripped his garment. Nobody wants to talk about that, but that's the truth because that was the consequence. Now, fast forward to today, we're all priests now. We're all priests now. So neither are we to come into the presence of God with a ripped garment. Said another way, in modern terms, if you're having marital difficulty and you think it's over, you think it's distressed and despair and hopeless, you are contrary to God by proverbially ripping that garment in his presence as a priest. What you're saying is, I know more about this than you do. I know this is hopeless. We're not called to be people of hopelessness. We're called to be people of hope. Do we not make mistakes? Yes, we make mistakes. Does it seem like some things are irreconcilable? Yes, they do. But we are called to be people of faith. We are called to keep our covering intact. We're called to believe as we cover our spouses. We're called to believe that it's unripped. And in the presence of God, it says, I do believe you. I do believe you can keep us friends, lovers, mates, spouse, husband, wife. I do believe that. Covering is important. My sin is covered by the blood of the lamb. Your sin is covered by the blood of the lamb. Nobody's ripping it. Nobody's saying that's not possible. So if you're in dire straits today and you've got marital difficulties, listen to me, please. There is a way. His name is Christ. Somehow, I'm telling you, I don't always have the answer how, somehow that garment can stay intact. That covering that started with Ruth and Boaz can remain intact. Somehow. Now, 43% of first marriages end up in divorce. 50-some percent of second, divorce. 73% of third, divorce. But I'm telling you, we're missing something by jumping to the cultural conclusion that something will not work. We're far too quick to come to that conclusion. We seek help far too late in the game. We begin to tear that covering far too soon. Everything is possible in Christ. At least we walk with that covering, that's the idea. A lack of intimacy in marriage does not constitute despair in the tearing of garments. Foundational to a Christian marriage is a confidence is a confidence under that thing right there. Under the covering of God, there's a confidence that something can be worked out. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What is this? What is this? This is grace. This is grace covering your life. This is the confidence that God is my authority, God has overseen my life, God has overseen my marriage, God has overseen my family, God has overseen every coming in and going out of my life. I'm under the grace of God. 
that is inexhaustible and irrevocable. I'm under a care and a concern and an involvement of a God who's covering my back. Grace. What we want to do is we want to look at one another and we want to point out one another's faults. We want to push the blame game. We want to go that route. We, I, I do this all the time. I listen to people come in. You can tell when they sit on the sofa, oh, this is going to be a long hour. Oh, my gosh. One person's looking over here and the other's looking over there. You can, you can feel the glacier between them. And the emphasis is the deficiency in one another, not the covering and the confidence of a grace, you see. That grace covers every one of us, covers the church. We sang about it this morning. The grace, the unmerited favor of God, this grace, just as I am. You know what I'm talking about this morning? The culture doesn't. I'm hoping you do. The first thing that we do in this culture is quit. It's over. And we resort to having to joke about it. We, we resort to having to make light of it. We resort to having to become familiar with it. We resort to kids having to deal with it. The broken family. Hello, someone's got to stop and say, hey, time out. You don't have to jump that far that quick right now. There's a grace that covers you. The man under this in his office or his bedroom or the man under this, not, if not physically, like proverbially, the man under the covering of God that's praying his way through, he's got something to offer his wife. He does. He's got something to speak into her life. He's got some transcendent way of dealing with her that doesn't bring him into the pettiness of deficiency but rises above it. The man under that clevering right there, that grace and that prayer and that intimacy with God has got some insight, some discernment, something when he sees his wife, he sees beauty. He sees liberty, he sees freedom, he sees a partner, he sees a friend, he sees a lover, he sees a human being. This right here, this covering of grace on a man will bring him to a, an understanding of his wife as lovely and admirable and noble and true and praiseworthy. It will not bring him down into the pettiness of returning insult for insult. The man under here, his prayers are not hindered because he treats his wife with consideration. Peter said that. If your prayers are hindered, it may be that woman next to you is not receiving the considerate care that she needs from a husband, and it may well be because you're not under this. Ouch. Boaz. He had a duty. The way it was set up now, he's sort of almost next in line to take care of Naomi's estate. He's a kinsman redeemer. Culturally speaking now, he's supposed to go in there and pay off Naomi's debts, buy her dead husband's estate, and provide for these women. It's his duty. There happens to be one guy before him. Well, he bows out. So now Boaz, you see, it's his duty. Here's a problem now. In marriage, too many Christians are looking at marriage as duty. And too many counselors are speaking to people as though this is simply your duty. Do it. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. It lasts for a season. You can clean up your act for a, for a couple of months, maybe six, but eventually duty's power runs out. It does. Guys, we got it rough. We got the short stick on the draw. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Is there a loftier duty? I mean, that is so lofty. You're, you're asking us to do what Christ did. And wives reverence your husband. Who wouldn't? Oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? I show up at home and I start loving my wife like Christ loved the church? I am the big man on campus. 
once she's submitted me to a drug test, <laughs> I'm it, man. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the number one dude on the face of the earth. The calling upon a man to do what he does for his wife is so lofty. So lofty, it's obvious it cannot be done without Christ's help. It cannot even begin to be done without Christ's help. Not that our wives are not lovable. Brother, do you consider the immensity of that statement? He hung naked on a cross, was abused, and gave himself up for her. We have issues with taking out the trash. How far away are we from that calling? See, the guy that's not under here, come on, come on, it ain't happening. If it is happening in your marriage, it's so far below potential. It may even be good by your own standards but it's so far below what it could be under this grace. The love that we are called to love our wives with comes from God himself and it's infused in our life under here in an intimate relationship with him. A lack of intimacy with your wife is an indication of a lack of intimacy under here by yourself with God. I don't know what that looks like for you. But you need to know what it looks like for you. Because everything flows out of that. Not duty, not duty, friend. Under that, under that, when a man is walking with God, it's not duty, it's desire. It's desire. You could not do that. It is a natural progression of an outflow of this relationship into a marriage relationship. And as I sit here to stand here this morning, I dig a bigger and bigger and bigger hole for myself. That's why I said, I want to get better at this, and where am I looking? I'm looking right in here, and what am I doing? I'm carving into this heart the deep need to get under this. And not just to have a better marriage. That's what most people do. They try to have a better marriage, but they don't go under that. And it runs out. It becomes duty, not desire. Under that, that's what it's about. See, here's the thing. Let's just speak, you know, guy gets up in the morning. His family's not up yet. Got appointments, he's gonna do what he's gonna to do today. Got work to do today. If he, as a bride, if you and I men as brides would get under this with a groom and set our time aside, talk to me, talk to me. Let me taste something of God today that I can feed my family. Let me taste something of God, I have something to give away. Give me something to eat this morning under here. I'll have something to feed someone with over there. A day goes by, a week, a week becomes a month. A month becomes a quarter. A quarter becomes half a year. A decade goes by. Yeah, we stood up. We've been married that long. Yeah, it's true. We have. I have the paper. But were you divorced long ago? That's the question. Are you friends, are you lovers, are you intimate? Do you know, are you growing, are you in an adventure? Are you learning things about one another? Are you challenging one another? Are you speaking truth and love to one another? Are you fighting the way you should fight, you see? It all comes from under here. An intimacy with God bleeds into an intimacy with a spouse. Honoring a marriage commitment based on profound trust in God's goodness will feel less like doing one's duty and more like pursuing one's deepest desire. Ladies, how would you like to be one's deepest desire? Or a responsibility? 
box to check off on a list. These are things to explore under here. I'm just introducing them to you. You get under there and think about them. See what comes out. Taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 32 and 7. And then go feed somebody. Single people, you have this, and you have what happens under here to be shared with everyone in your life, undistracted, undivided, total devotion. Single women, you ought to be lifting up some of these young teenagers and teaching them the ways of the Lord. You ought to, you ought to be building them up, encouraging them, taking what, under, what happens under here, feeding it. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, 22 year olds, take this, take this. This is for the single. This, this under here, friend, this is where it's at. Single moms, I can't even fathom how difficult that is. Under here, if you're not under here, you're under the weight of the worry, of the fear, of the anxiety, of the, the oppression of understanding how you're ever gonna get from point A to point B. Under here is where it's at, you see. And then we come to risk and rejection. Emotionally unavailable men feel this. Your wife deeply wants inside your heart to know what's in there. Open it up and gain the confidence you'll not be rejected when you share it. Offer the loving words that she wants to hear. Offer the, the encouragement. Offer the, the soul secrets. Offer those things that you've talked about under here and, and give them to her so you can feel nearer to one another. Women, if, you, if you're the complaining, cantankerous type who points out what your husband's not doing, uh, keep your mouth shut long enough that he can actually say something that he got from under here. He's gonna do it. Pull it out of him, encourage him, love him, tell him. He'll tell you. It'll be so far the superficial of what you're expecting. He'll tell you, get him under here. He gets under here, you got it made, you see. It's a risk. It's like jumping off a cliff. Oh no, I'm gonna share something that I don't normally share. Here it goes. And you jump off that cliff, but God catches you. Boom, holds you. You're not gonna get smashed. Guys, open up. Open up. Man, we need some romantics in this place. You Italians, you ought to start a ministry in here. You ought to get with Lapoli and the rest of them, get all the Italians together, they can teach us how to be romantic, you see. People want to hear from the deepest part of your heart and as you grow in your relationships, you see. That's what they want. That's what they want. That's what God wants. The two coming one. Acceptance. Okay, here we go. At the end of the day, just because you've done all that doesn't mean you're gonna enjoy every aspect of one another. We just are, some of us, you know, we're not gonna be everything to the other person. And we just gotta accept. Just gotta accept, that's the way he is. That's the way she is. It's okay, enjoy it, celebrate it. You're different. You're never gonna to be totally on par, you see. It's okay, no big deal, accept it. It involves a deeper work of acceptance, a, a deeper work of approval, of building someone up. It's okay, I understand it. We're never gonna to be totally what everyone needs for one another, it's all right. You set that expectation, you end up extremely disappointed. Okay, so we're gonna close our service right now in this place. We have a couple come up here, sit in these two chairs. We're gonna close in prayer. So why don't we have, why don't we have Bob and Lisa Dews? They look like a beautiful couple. Come up here, Bob. Lisa, and let's, while they're coming, I want you to think about your marriage now. Think about it. Facts, opinions, passions, transparency, vulnerability, intimacy. Where are you? What's going on with that? Where are you in that mix? Where can we become closer? And where, 
where does sarcasm come in? <laughs> For every couple in this church, Father, I pray, oneness with you, intimacy with you, quality time, quality moments, inspiration, rest. Upon this man and the men of the church, let fall fresh and anew the mantle of husband, of a caring gentleman who's a gentle man, a sacrificial man, a man who's heard from you, tasted things of you and served them to his bride. A sensitive man. Immersed in the blood of Jesus Christ and covered in the grace of Christ. To cover his bride and protect her. Care for her. To walk beside her. To lift her up. be friends, partners, lovers, to be of one mind, one heart, to consider one another, that their homes would be filled with laughter and peace and joy, understanding and patience. Upon this woman, let there be fresh and anew the mantle of wife. And bless her when she comes in and when she goes out. Help her to celebrate her husband, to celebrate life, children, to laugh, to play, to rest, to care. Infuse both hearts with a love one for another and for you that isn't there, but can be. And let there be no despair, no broken garments, just a whole covering of grace. We celebrate every marriage here from the first day of the covenant to the day today, to this moment. Blessing, blessing, blessing. I pray upon the couples of this church, even today, before we go to sleep tonight, we talk about such things. Can we be more open? Can we learn more one from another? How can I support you and encourage you? How can I build you up? Can we laugh more, play more, spend time together more? Oh God, upon this church, let that rest. In Jesus' holy name, and the church said, amen.